Hello, I'm Rosie Serdival. I'm a local historian and a colleague and I have recently completed some work on a book about the events in Scotland and England in 1650. What I want to talk to you about is the fate of 5,000 defeated Scots soldiers following the Battle of Dunbar in that year. Marched south with little in the way of medical care, food and water, many of them would die. Any of you who've seen the Errol Flynn film, Captain Blood, will recognise what happened next. Thousands would find themselves shipped off to the New World as indentured servants. In their case, a different form of slavery, but one with an end date. But first, I'd like to give you a little bit of context. The Battle of Dunbar in 1650 has been described as one of the shortest and certainly one of the most bloody of the 17th century civil wars. These days, we tend to refer to them as the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, but when I grew up, it was always the English Civil War. By 1650, they'd been fighting in the British Isles for 11 young, long years as an alliance of English parliamentarians and Scottish Covenanters sought to reduce the power of the Crown. That alliance had broken down after the English executed King Charles I, leaving the Scots fearful that their capacity for self-determination was about to be reduced. The Scots now swung their support behind the old king's son, later to be known as Charles II, and that prompted Cromwell to invade in retaliation. He was to inflict the final and fatal blow in the conflict at Dunbar on the 3rd of September, when he unexpectedly attacked the larger army of General David Leslie outside the small harbour town of Dunbar and destroyed it. In less than an hour, the English Parliamentarian Army had put paid to Scots' capacity to support the claims of Charles II. And some 10,000 10, men and a few of the women who accompanied them found themselves prisoners of war. Older men and those seriously injured were allowed to leave, reducing the number of prisoners down to about 5,000. The problem now was to ensure that these men simply couldn't take up arms again. Cromwell's note, which you can see on screen at the moment, uh, makes it clear that the intention was not to mistreat these men, but to ensure that there could be no repetition of the conflict and that there were no resources that he could spare, either in terms of food or medical care. His great problem was that his own army had been unable to resupply itself before the battle, and he was now gathering resources to look after them. He had nothing to spare for the men he now sent marching south. The information that we're looking at here is the correspondence between Sir Arthur Hazelrig, governor of Newcastle, and Cromwell himself. Hazelrig had been put in charge of the march south. For many of the 5,000 men who now set on their way, this had probably been their first military encounter. Don't forget that what we have here are the young and the strong, the men who had been raised as new levies immediately before the battle. And they had already been without food for 24 hours. The Presbyterian clergy who played such a prominent role in the Scots army had declared that there would be a fast in order to attract God's good will to keep him on their side during the battle. Now those men and a few of their women set off on a route that would take them through Berwick, Annick, Morpeth, Newcastle and on to Durham. Along the way, ill-fed, ill-watered, many were to die, mostly from illness and malnutrition, though there were some executions. We know, for example, that at Berwick, a few men were shot. We know a huge amount about these poor souls, thanks to the work done in Durham in 2013. A team at Durham University took over the archeological excavation when around 29 skeletons were discovered when building work commenced under a new cafe at the Palace Green Library. 
We think about 1,700 men died in total on the way from Dunbar to London. The picture on screen at the moment is the garden just outside Morpeth Castle, now a park in the town centre, where many of them were sheltered overnight. We're told that while they were there, they, having not, not having any food for many days, dug up the cabbages that they found planted in the garden. And that is probably where they picked up dysentery. Those cabbages had probably been fertilized using human night soil. Dysentery is an infectious disease of the intestines, particularly of the colon. The symptoms appear a few hours up to five days after ingestion. And it's commonly caused by consuming human feces in water in some form. Hence the link with the cabbages, we think. An untreated sufferer can produce as much as 20 to 10 to 20 litres of diarrhoea a day, and the mortality rates are high, 50 to 60 percent. Deprive someone of food or drink for more than five days. And don't forget, by this time, the Scots have been suffering this for nearly two weeks. And the human body starts to conserve energy by reducing organ function and cellular activity. Moving on to Newcastle, we know that the dysentery was spreading fast. We have a graphic account here of the cost of cleaning St Nicholas's Cathedral on the day after the men moved on to heading to Chester Street en route to Durham. The cost of cleaning St Nicholas's Church was huge in terms of the time, over £350 in modern money. Here we have an image of Durham. Uh, the top painting is sometime in the 18th century, far later than our period. But if you look at the bottom picture taken a couple of years ago, you can see where I have marked out the square where the bodies were found. That is now the Palace Green Library Cafe. And here is the cathedral itself with the nave where anywhere up to three and a half thousand men were kept. The building was no longer in use as a church. Parliament had secularised it. Now it was just a big, handy open space, ideal for the purposes to which it was about to be put. The Scots, of course, had been here twice before, in 1644 and in 1640 as conquerors. They can't have been a warm welcome for them there was probably still a fair amount of resentment for these men who'd occupied the city. And yet Hazelrig, we know, showed some spark of pity and was able to find local women who were willing to help to no nurse the men who were so ill. Many of them were moved to better conditions in the castle. But the rest, at least 3,000, were simply dumped in the cathedral. With an interior space of 4,000 square metres, it was probably about the only structure big enough to house so many. By the standards of the time, we're looking at a number that equaled the size of a, a small or medium sized town. Dysentery, now rife, was terribly contagious and the men had no means of keeping warm. They made fires with whatever was available. We hear of church fittings being pulled down, particularly anything made of wood. And people amongst that population complained that they would wake up in the morning to find any piece of wood with them stolen and used to light a fire by somebody else. We hear of crutches being taken, walking sticks. One man who had a prosthetic leg woke up to found that gone. If you look at this picture of the nave, you begin to get a sense of just how much crowded it must have been. This is a, a picture taken in the 1950s, I think. Nowhere near 3,000 people crammed in there. Attempts to feed the men may well have done more harm than good. This is a, another report from Hazelrig, again writing to the Council of State and to Cromwell, explaining what he's done to try and get some nutrition into the town. Unfortunately, what he's chosen, while it's well-intentioned, is probably about the worst thing that you could give somebody suffering from dysentery. 
Sudden feeding or rehydration triggers insulin production, which affects the production of electro sorry, electrolytes. They control the flow of water into and out of cells and spark the nerve functions that control things like breathing and heart function. It's particularly important that those electrolytes are replaced at a steady rate when you start feeding. If you've ever had to deal with a baby that's had diarrhea, you'll know that they're now given a liquid with salts and sugar in carefully judged amounts. Get it wrong and you run the risk of flooding the body with fluids causing cardiac arrest. That probably killed at least some of the men who died here in the cathedral. Discipline was not wholly lacking. It seems that the men used the west end of the nave for living and the east, colder end, as a toilet. The archaeological analysis in 2013 found that there were still traces of a film adhering to the flagstones that appeared to be urine deposits. To put it bluntly, the men were sleeping at one end of the cathedral and urinating at the other. Scorch marks, possibly from braziers, give some support to this idea. Those who survived would find themselves shipped on to London and Southampton. From there, they would head overseas, largely to the Americas and to the Caribbean. This transportation had a number of functions. It meant the potential opponents were kept at bay, taken far away from where they might cause trouble. It provided a pool of healthy labour for the colonies. And of course, it helped to recoup the costs of the war because these men were sold. It wasn't at all unusual for large groups to be transported instead of facing prison or the gallows. The Dunbar men were just some of many. In Ireland, for example, during the Cromwellian Wars that followed from 1651, there were large numbers said to have reached as high as 10,000 people, men, women and children, who were also transported overseas. Get rid of the troublemakers and do yourself some good at the same time was the thinking. Nor did the process of transportation cease with the end of the Commonwealth. In the late 17th century, hundreds were consigned to Jamaica, though many more would go to Maryland and Virginia. We know of at least four and a half thousand pardoned for the colonies between 1661 and 1700. Women and children had a value as well as fit and able men, not least as a way of persuading men whose time of indenture had run to stay on in the colonies and to settle. It was a two for one offer very often. A man taking on a maid would pay 120 pounds of tobacco for her but would be entitled to an apprentice, usually a child, for only another 20 pounds. Between 1620 and 1775, some 300,000 free willers, people who had chosen to go this way as a means of getting themselves out as immigrants, would arrive in the Americas. Two out of three migrants from the British Isles would go that way. The transportation of the Scots prisoners was to be repeated after the Battle of Worcester in 1651, when another 8,000 would become captive. The Council of State instructed the Committee for Prisoners to grant a license to send these men to the West Indies. Here the crop was sugar rather than tobacco, but it was equally valuable and it required equal back-breaking labour to get it from the fields onto the ships. Indenture was meant to be time limited, but the men who were sent out forcibly were dependent on the goodwill and honesty of their employers. There was little recourse if you weren't freed at the time promised. We know, for example, of a group of Scots sent out after the Battle of Worcester, who complained in 1656 that they were still being held as indentured servants, even though their time should have expired. The London Committee of Inquiry, which investigated the matter, upheld their sentences rather than releasing them. And of course, it was a dangerous business just getting there. 
the shipboard mortality rate for forced transportees has been estimated at between 15 and 30 percent and nor did it improve when they landed within a 15 year period sorry within a five year period of arriving at their destination around 35 percent of women and 50 percent of men shipped as indentures between 1620 and 1680 were dead the practice would become a major business with up to 200 a time being shipped overseas but we do not have any real idea of the numbers on two ships for whom we have the most records the sarah and john and the unity both took scots prisoners one from dunbar one set following the battle of worcester and we've been able to add to the information that we have about them because of the activities of the descendants of many of the men who went. The Scottish Prisoners of War Society is a group of people mostly based in America who've been researching for a very long time exactly who their ancestors were, how they got there and what their treatment was when they arrived. We know on November the 11th, 1651, Hazelrig was told to deliver 150 prisoners to Augustine Walker, who would take them to New England. He was the captain of the Unity, which sailed in the winter instead of waiting for spring. The trip must have been horribly rough, and we know that many of the prisoners had scurvy along the way. But it seems that all of them arrived safely in Boston near the end of December. We don't have a ship's passenger list for the Unity, though we have one for the John and Sarah. Most of what we know about the men that we think arrived on that comes from the Scottish Prisoners of War Society. They found at least 180 names of men who appear to have arrived in New England at about the right time and who seem to fill the criteria. But of course, the victims are not just those who are transported. There are also those left behind. Wives and families who are every bit as much casualties of prison of war. There were no established funding mechanisms for, for war widows or for those left destitute. Women had to throw themselves on the mercy of the church. For the families of the POWs, there was nothing but the anguish of waiting. Many of them would probably live out their lives and go to their graves, not knowing what had happened to fathers, sons, brothers, or husbands. In the wake of the battle, the commissioners of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland organized a day of national fasting, something they seem to have been fond of. More helpfully, individual parishes began collecting donations to help those who'd been left behind. We know, for example, of Helen Smith, widow of John Young, who was killed at Dunbar. She appealed to her Kirk at Cull Ross, who awarded her 12 shillings a month, probably about the best that could be offered at the time. Some women, of course, would want to remarry, but would not know whether their husbands were alive or dead. As late as 1655, the Synod of Fife was debating the position and declared that a war widow had to either obtain clear evidence of her husband's death or seek a declaration from the courts to that effect. Most of the Scots prisoners on the Unity were consigned to two businesses in Maine and Massachusetts in which the bro brokers of the voyage had an interest. 62 of the Scots are known to have been sent here the Sorgus Iron Works in Lynn, Massachusetts, one of the first iron manufactories in North America. Today, it's a living history museum. What you're looking at is a modern image that must have been pretty much the same as those men found when they arrived there. Perhaps rather tidier and rather more prettily planted these days, of course. The rest of the crew, sorry, the rest of the transportees were sold as indentured servants to local residents. People buying them would pay 20 to 30 pounds a man. Since the typical cost for transporting them was around five pounds, 
that meant there was a considerable profit to be shown on the journey. About £1,500, approximately 105000 in today's terms. Survivors from Dunbar were sold into forced labour in mines, forges, mills and plantations across New England and elsewhere in the Americas. Some did well. Many years later, one of the Scots who settled in New Jersey from around 1680 onwards wrote home that he'd had a drink with one of the old buckskin planters, as he said, put it. This was a Scot who, he said, had been sent away by Cromwell to New England as a slave from Dunbar. Living now in Woodbridge like a Scottish laird, he wishes his countrymen and his native soil very well, though he never intends to see it again. The records of the Irish transportees that I put up on screen earlier mention a businessman called Richard Leader, who was acting as a broker and transport arranger between 1650 and 1660. He was an English businessman engaged in trade between America, England and Scotland. And we know that in 1651, recently resigned from managing the Saugus Ironworks, he began with his brother George the management of mills on the nearby Great Works River at Kittery, also in Maine. Leader brought with him the bond prisoners that he purchased for use at Saugus. Ownership of these men was personal rather than institutional. Having been bought for 50 to 30 pounds each, five years later he was in a position to sell out his interests and to free many of his bond servants. An awful lot of them seem to have actually obtained land grants in Kittery. You wonder if perhaps one of the conditions of their release was that they would continue to settle there. There was a system for paying a, a kind of finder's fee, if you like, to people who found settlers for some of the new territories. And it's possible that Leader was in a position to find himself paid twice or even three times for bringing the same men to the Americas. When they got to America, the men of Dunbar found something very familiar waiting for them in the colonies of Massachusetts and New England. The Congregationalists of the area shared many of the beliefs of the Scots Presbyterians but there were some striking differences as well. The Puritans of New England had a worldview, a sense of the proper order of society at variance with the relatively relaxed practice of the Scots. It's a bit entertaining really, given that we think of Scots Calvinism as being very dour, but there's plenty of evidence that Puritan New England viewed its Scots edition as morally slack and the Innes trial is probably a prime example of it. Sometimes we find two groups of Cromwell's deportees meeting up. Alexander Innes was one of the unity men who served his time at the Saugus Works and who settled in Taunton, Massachusetts, where he married an Irish woman, Catherine Briggs, quite possibly one of the women who'd been transported from Ireland a few years later after he'd set off. Was she one of Cromwell's Irish transportees? We're told that an Irish woman called Catherine Ames, in his story, was brought before the court at Plymouth in February 1656 or 7 upon suspicion of committing adultery. We've translated the following text into modern English to make it a little bit easier to follow. While it may appear quite clear, the terminology of the time can make it surprisingly hard to follow. Essentially, what happens is that Catherine appears to have been caught committing adultery with another Scotsman, William Paul. We don't know if he's another Dunbar man since he's listed as a probable rather than a definite on the Scottish Prisoners of War website. We do know that Alexander Innes was away at the time of the affair and that he was initially called as a witness rather than a defendant. However, the law held the husband responsible for his wife's morals as well as his, her behavior. After all, 
everybody knew that women, as a result of Eve's original sin, were incapable of restraining themselves. They were naturally sinful and had to be kept in, kept in check. Yet Alexander now found himself in trouble for having gone away and left his wife available for temptation. He was convicted for leaving her unsupervised. In fact, the sentence suggests that he was effectively regarded as being her pimp. He was put in the stocks for the duration of her whippings and was also ordered to pay both his own and Catherine's court costs, something we know he could only afford to do in instalments of 12 pence a week. We don't know how long Catherine had to wear the letter B on the sleeve of her dress, something intended to humiliate and shame her. It's very reminiscent of the letter A mentioned by Nathaniel Hawthorne in his novel of the same name, The Scarlet Letter. We've got some clips from the films here. I think the first one from 1926 is particularly good at making vivid just how much public shame was entailed in the wearing of this sort of letter. All three of them, Alexander, his wife Catherine, and William Paul remain in the area for many years afterwards. And we know that Alexander and Catherine will go on to have many children. Their descendants are amongst those who took to put together the records. These people are remembered. They're not just an afterthought in the history of the Americas. What you have here are memorial stones erected at Sorgus at a house nearby where the Scots prisoners were thought to have been housed during the time working there. From the family records, we know that many of them would go on to be heavily involved in the history of the Americas. Men would serve on both sides in the wars of independence. They would be involved in the Indian wars. They would be involved in developing and extending the colonies across the entire continent. They have a presence in the modern world and they are remembered. We tend, of course, to think of our subjects in isolation in their own timeline. But again and again, we hear from the families, from the descendants, about the achievements of those men. Modern in reckoning puts their number somewhere in the region of a quarter of a million. What they did was not just build a new lives for themselves. They built a new life for a nation. They built that nation indeed. We are particularly grateful to the people who have helped us to put this bit of work together. To those who did the initial research on the death march like John Malden. To Chris Gerrard and Andrew Millard, as well as the rest of the archeological team at Durham University, who carried out that initial excavation and wrote it up in a fascinating book lost lives, new voices, but in particular to the descendants of the men of Dunbar, who remember them so vividly and who helped us to bring them alive when we came to put our book together recently. I've included some information here about other sources if you wish to pursue this uh, debate any further, but I must very definitely recommend that you take a look at the Scottish Prisoner of War site. They have ongoing information there and their sense of pride and of connection with their families really helps to bring their stories alive. Thank you very much.